الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العظيم إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد مبارك وسلم صل عليه Most honorable and beloved Qibla Allama Mulna Hafiz Abdul Wafusa my more learned colleague my dear brother my friend Dr. Hafiz Atar Hussain Sahib Al-Azhari, Mulna Hassan Rabani, my brothers, my sisters, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. I appreciate it's 9.35, we said we were going to finish at 10 o'clock, so I won't keep you for too long. Just very briefly, I want to share with you some thoughts. I'm going to second what Dr. Saab said before me. We're not replacing any uh, health service available to you. What we are doing is sharing with you some of the wisdoms that we have encountered in ahadith, in sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, that help us deal with the mental health issues that, that, that we suffer from or that we may likely suffer from. Uh, and the verses of the Quran that, that speak to us and instruct us how we might actually deal with, with things that, that we're struggling with in our life. Uh, without going over everything that's already been said, first and foremost, if it, it, your life is all about how you perceive it to be. Uh, isn't this, uh, Brother Nadeem, what we say in CBT, cognition, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognition is your own perception of what your existence should be. If you think that your life is going to be easy, I'm sorry, you're going to be disappointed. Because life, unfortunately, isn't easy. And if you think that I can avoid all challenges in my life, you're going to be awfully disappointed because you can't avoid challenges in your life. In the verse that Dr. Saab read to us at the beginning, Allah Almighty says to the believers, do the believers think that just because they've said, we believe that they're just going to be left alone and they're not going to be tested? In other verses, Allah Almighty says, Am hasibtum an tadkhulul jannata wa lamma ya'tikum mathalul ladheena khalaw min qablikum masadhumul ba'saul waddarra'u wa zulzilu hatta yakula al-rasul wal ladheena amanu ma'ahu mata nasrullah. You know, do you think that you're going to enter into paradise and you won't be encountering any of the challenges that those people who, uh, uh, who... The challenges that those people before you had faced? Do you know they faced incredible challenges? They faced so much tribulation. They faced so much difficulty. And they faced earthquakes so much so that even the prophets and the people of the strongest faith eventually were reduced to say, Mata Nasrullah, Mata Nasrullah. When is the help of Allah Almighty going to come? When is Allah Almighty going to rescue the, uh, us from this? Allah Almighty says, Allah, inna Nasrullahi qareeb. Let it be known the help of Allah Almighty is nearby. So, you know, in that verse, you get the same reassurance that, that you need. So, this is actually life. You know, life is difficult. You know, first and foremost, accept that. We're okay to accept that life is, is difficult, and this is very, very important. I'm going to just, uh, in, in the time that I have, I, I just want to pick on a, a couple of things. And, and I want to offer you something of what we found in, uh, in Hadith uh, in, in relation to that. I'm, the first thing I'm going to pick up on is what Dr. Saab was saying before me. We are spending far too much time on the phones. Okay? Uh, on top of everything that Dr. Sam has already told you, there is a negativity. People are schizophrenic. <coughs> Do you know, uh, social media is, is like an intoxicant, isn't it? Uh, th this is why people become schizophrenic. This is why people are something else on social media and there's something else in person. 
And you know, just like when a person becomes intoxicated on alcohol, you see a vulgar side of them. When they become intoxicated on so social media, you see a vulgar side of them. Which is why people can write things that they couldn't say to you on your face. Which is why they can type things which are so foul, but they wouldn't have ever said to you in front of you. You know, this, this is what social media does. On top of that, you know, one of the problems that we have is that we face an information overload like never before in the past. You know, our, our biggest problem, our biggest benefit, you know, we, we do benefit from it massively, uh, is our search tools. Thanks to Google, you can search absolutely anything, but you know, with information overload. If you're suffering from depression, I'll tell you, one of the worst things you can do is go on to Google. Don't, you know, if you're suffering from depression, don't go to Google, honestly. It's, it, there's nothing worse. You know, if you've got a headache, and, and you've got slightly blurry vision, don't type in symptoms of headache and blurry vision on Google, it's gonna come back and tell you, this, you've possibly got a brain tumor. So long before, you've already self-diagnosed, now you've got a brain tumor, you're already on your way to your death, start writing your will, won't you? You, know, you, you may as well, because this is what it is. And you know what Allah Almighty says, don't ask Google, when you don't know something, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُ You know, before you start self-diagnosing, go to a GP, go to a doctor, say to him, this is what it is. You know, it's quite possible he's going to tell you, you just need your ears syringing, it causes imbalance, it can give you headaches too. And you know, at home you were self-diagnosing with brain tumors. <laughs> right? you, honestly, too much information, if you don't have the capacity to be able to organize and draw from that, it can be really dangerous. And, and this is why the Prophet said, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِي From the excellence of a person's Iman, from the excellence of a person's Islam, is that he disregards, he uh, leaves that which doesn't concern him. And this, this applies, you know, Dr. Salah was saying just, just before me, what you receive on social media is so negative. It is always so negative and you're constantly reading that. Of course you're going to develop negative thoughts. You're constantly reading negative thoughts. And then don't, you know, the, uh, don't, don't be looking at all of that. Uh, it, it's really, really important that you occupy yourself in, in, in things which are beneficial to you and leave those things which have play absolutely no role in your life. In Ayyuh uh, al Imam al-Ghazali, he, he narrates uh, a narration in which he says, Alamatu i'radillahi ta'ala, from the Prophet it's been attributed to the Prophet Alamatu i'radillahi ta'ala, ala abdihi ishtighaluhu bima la ya'ni. One of the signs of Allah Almighty giving up, giving up on his subject is that he allows him to become occupied in things which, have, which are meaningless to him. And you know, honestly, that's what we need to think about. You know, if you bring yourself to reality, you know, if I do find out about the accident that's taken place in Norway or Pakistan or India, I can't really do a great deal for them now. It's too late. What am I going to do with all of that information? So really, the, this information overload that, that we experience, it can be really, really bad for you. Be careful, stay away from it. Uh, if, you, if you're not already depressed, you're going to end up depressed. Uh, and and, and that's, that, that's the truth of it. Uh, number two, the second thing is that every single day, make sure you are engaged in something good. Make sure, even, even if you're already depressed, engage in amal salih a virtuous act, a kind act. Now this is so, so crucial. It is so important. You know, even if you, uh, if you are struggling and, and you're not confident and you're not feeling great, do something. You know, the, the one moment of feeling that I've achieved something, I've done something. And it only has to be something small. Don't try to tackle something magnificent. You know, what I'm su suggesting to you is if you want to read Nafal, 
Don't say niyat kiti is namaz di so rakat namaz nafil. No, Allah Almighty didn't want so rakat namaz nafil. He didn't want a hundred rakahs from you. Just make it two, but make it consistent. That's it. That's all that's needed. You know, do an amal salih. Get some bird seeds and go feed the birds. And then just take a moment and see the birds come and eat those seeds. It feels good. Go and help somebody. Just for a moment. And I'm not saying that spend your entire life at the service of others, though, if you could, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but we've all got jobs to go to. You, you do what you need to, but take a moment out and do just something virtuous and something good. And, and if you did that, and you see the, the fruits of what you've just done, you see what you've actually just achieved, I'll tell you, automatically what you get from that is a feel-good factor. What you get from that is a satisfaction that I've done something, uh, I've done something valuable, I've contributed. And that is how you claw yourself back out of depression. And this isn't going to fix you, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you a wonder fix. <coughs> it's not something that you just do it once and your problems are solved. No, this is something you're going to do every single day, every single day until, until this becomes a pattern in your life. It takes years to get into depression, it's going to take years to get back out of it. Accept that, but work with it every single day. Uh, you know, this is, this is absolutely crucial. The, the, the Prophet وسلم, said in hadith, min al ma Only, only assume or adopt tasks that you are able to complete. فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الْعَمَلِ أَذْوَمُهُ وَإِنْ قَلْمُ the Prophet ﷺ said, only set out tasks that you can fulfill for the best of actions that you do are the ones that are most persistent, even if they're tiny acts. Just do a tiny act, but do it every single day. This is what the Prophet ﷺ instructed you to do. Just a small thing, but do it absolutely every single day. And you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, with, with cognition, a lot of it, uh, and, and your responses, a lot of it relies on knowledge. A lot of it relies on belief. You know, a lot of mental health relies on these two things principally, does it not? Knowledge and belief. Knowledge is your past experiences. Belief is what you convince yourself of. Now, let me tell you, you know, when you do something good, when you do something virtuous, you feel good in yourself and you feel good in the presence of your Lord. Honestly, you feel like now I've done something good. Now I've come to the aid of a fellow human being. Now I've come and I've fed the birds. I've helped the makhluk of Allah Almighty in some way. Now I feel like I have a right to make a dua and supplicate in front of Allah Almighty. You feel like you're worthy of even making that dua. And if you don't have that feeling that I'm even worthy of making a dua, essentially you're just petitioning knowing that it's going to be rejected and that's a bad way to be. Honestly, never ever make a dua to Allah Almighty thinking that He's going to reject. Never ever. You know, a person should never make a dua to his Lord saying, if Allah wills, He will accept it. And if He wills, He will reject it. Don't. Never ever think that. Say, my Lord is Kareem. My Lord is generous. My, my Lord is kind. My Lord is merciful. And you know, I, you've got to have this belief that when I make this dua, Allah <coughs> Almighty will accept it. You know, you've got to really have, you've got to take that approach. And when you've done a good action, when you've done a good action and then you've gone to your Lord and you made that dua, you're going to say it with conviction. The Prophet ﷺ said, Make a dua to Allah Almighty, supplicate to Allah Almighty, whilst you have absolute yaqeen, whilst you have absolute certainty that He's going to respond to you. And rest assured, Allah Almighty never turns your duas away. Never. Not when you sincerely turn to Him and ask Him. He'll never. There's always three ways your, your du'as are accepted. Either one, Allah Almighty will accept your du'a and He will grant you exactly what you're asking for. 
either two, Allah Almighty will avail from you a hardship or a tribulation that was about to befall you. And if none of these two happen in this world, then on Akhirat, on the day of judgment, when you come before your Lord, you're going to see pearls that are put on the scales in favor of your virtue. And a man will say to his Lord, Ya Allah, I can, I can remember doing a lot of good actions, but I can never ever remember any virtuous act that should amount to these pearls. And Allah Almighty will say to him, O oh my subject, these pearls are the du'as that you had made that I hadn't granted you in the world. They never went to it. You know, that's the yaqeen with which you turn to your Lord. He never ever turn, turn you away. It just simply will never ever happen. Uh, we're racing against time, it's 9.49 now. Uh, climate and in environment, you know, this, this is so, so important. So important. Look at the environment that you are all living in. You just walk out of here, we live in concrete jungles. Right, we drink milk, we, we've never seen the cows from which that milk came. You know, you're eating chicken, you've never seen the farms where those chickens are reared and raised. You're eating sheep. You've never seen the, the grounds on which the sheep have walked. You're eating wheat and flour. You, you haven't seen the stalks of wheat. You, you're totally disconnected with nature. You're uh, drinking your uh, magical uh, drinks made of vegetables and, and grass, and you haven't seen a blade of grass for a long time. You know, this has become our reality. Sometimes, sometimes the closest to nature that we get is when we walk out of here and you see birds sat on the telephone line outside. You know, that'll be just about the only nature you see. You know, this, it's not good for us. It is highly important, highly important that you go back and actually see nature. Can you not see that everything around us has become artificial? Our grounds have become concrete, it's artificial. Our lights have become artificial. We almost don't have, you know, sometimes we diagnose ourselves with depression when it actually, uh, we're just lacking uh, vitamin D because we've not been out in the sunlight. You know, we're, we're Asian, we need sunlight. Right? We're, a, a lot of uh, Caucasian people here in this country are lacking vitamin D because they don't have enough exposure. Uh, us more so. You know, we, just simple things like this, get back out to nature. The, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yanzuru ila al-khadara, is it, wal ma'il jari. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam used to love going to just look at streams. And he used to go and look at uh, greenery. You know, just try it. Honestly, if you, you really, you want to cure just go out, just to nature for a little bit. Go away from the roads where you can't hear cars for a while. Just go out, away from the roads where all you can hear is the stream. And just for a second, listen to the stream. Just for a second, look at the blades of, of grass. Just for a second, turn on the recitation in that peacefulness and listen to the recitation and the translation. You know, see what it will do for you. You've got to give yourself a chance. And in changing environments, you know, if you can't get out there, then come back to the masjid. Honestly, just come back to the masjid. The world around you is incredibly noisy. Everything is a noise around you. You're hearing too much. You're seeing too much. Sometimes the only thing you need to do is just slow your life right now. Just bring it to a, a total state of calmness. Just bring it to a moment where you can stop and just breathe. And do you know where that's going to happen? In the masjid. When you come back into the masjid, you know when you're in here and the doors are shut, is it or is it not serenely quiet? You know when the imam is standing there and has said, Allahu Akbar, and the hands are tied, you're standing there serenely quiet, just still. Sometimes that's all we need, just to stand still for a moment. You know, your environment, and, and it, again, it, it, it relates to uh, social media and technology. 
Technology has connected us more so with people all around the world, but disconnected us with those who are immediately sat around us. Uh, I, I remember going, this was years ago, with my brothers and friends to Morocco. Every, I didn't take a phone with me, what a mistake. Every single time we hit a Wi-Fi spot, all my brothers and friends were just turning on the Wi-Fi. On the, and honestly, I just sat there and I said, well, what am I supposed to do now? I can't talk to him, can't talk to him, well, I can't talk to any of them now. You know, they're so engaged with everybody else, they're totally disengaged with the one who's present. You know what the mosque, mosque does? The mosque brings you together again. It stands you alongside somebody. You know, after the namaz, after the salat, you shake hands with somebody. This is important. You know, this is crucial to our existence. This was uh, the, the practice of the Prophet ﷺ is that the masjid brings everybody together. This is why it's important for us. And uh, there's, a, there's a hadith sharif uh, that says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا فَقَدَ الرَّجُلَ مِنْ إِخْوَانِهِ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ سَأَلَ عَنْهُ Whenever the Prophet ﷺ would find that one of his companions was missing for three days, سَأَلَ عَنْهُ The Prophet ﷺ would always ask after him, Where is Fulan? I haven't seen Fulan for three days. I haven't seen him. فَإِنْ كَانَ غَائِبًا دَعَالَ وَإِنْ كَانَ شَاهِدًا زَارَ وَإِنْ كَانَ مَلِيدًا عَادَ If that person was absent, the Prophet ﷺ used to say to his Sahaba, go and call him with you, go and bring him here, tell him I want to see him. If that person was there, وَإِنْ كَانَ شَاهِدًا If he was there, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, okay, oh, he's there in the back corner, I want to go and speak to him, come, come here, tell him to come here and he'd go and speak to him. وَإِنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا If that person was sick, the Prophet ﷺ used to personally go and pay him a visit. You know, this, it's going to remove the depression from you. And if we don't do that, you know, just to know, you know, sometimes all a person needs is for faith in humanity to be restored. To know that somebody cares. Sometimes that's all people need. And, and this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ had done for his Sahaba. You know, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were so in love with the Prophet ﷺ because every single one of them knew the Prophet to have a particular relationship with them. You know, they always knew that he is the most affectionate with me. That's how they felt. Every single one of them. You know, every single... Sahabi was important to the Prophet <coughs> alayhi salatu You know, do this. This is important. This is important for, for your welfare and for uh, the welfare of, of those uh, around you. Uh, there's uh, other, other points as well. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if we've got time, time for that. But, you know, importantly in uh, tackling uh, depression and anxiety and uh, these sorts of issues. One of, the, one of the problems or one of the issues that we have is mindsets and attitudes. Uh, once you have developed a negative attitude, it's very hard to overcome, but it is very important for you to understand when you are experiencing a negative attitude. Just like uh, Dr. Sahib before me has said, you know, Shariat has never said to you, don't have a negative attitude. Shariat has never said that. It says, acknowledge when you are having a negative attitude. Acknowledge it. And in this, isn't this what the verse of the Quran is saying? When, when, you, when you experience a waswasa, when you experience negative thoughts from the shaitan, fasta'idh billah, acknowledge it. Acknowledge, say that actually, no, I'm not, I'm not going to give in to this. Mm. You know, say that I'm, I'm going to challenge that thought. I'm going to challenge the negative thought, I'm going to replace it with a positive thought. And I'm going to use my faith, and I'm going to use my knowledge to determine that I'm going to do the right thing. Fasta'idh billah, then seek refuge with Allah Almighty. You know, this is the perfect time for you to say, Ya Allah, help me, Ya Allah, help me. And Allah Almighty will come to your aid. 
Inna hu huwa samiyyu al-alim. Allah Almighty is all hearing and all aware of the, the challenges and the difficulties you're facing. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the perfect example from the lifetime. You know, uh, um, brother Nadim, is it? It's called heuristics. Is it your uh, impulsive response? Your when naturally, mentally, when you deal with things. One of the things that you do mentally is you build quick responses, immediate responses, gut instincts. And, and this is good. It's, it's, uh, usually it helps us um, to make decisions. It, it's, it saves us hours and hours of analyzing things in our minds. You very quickly know whether something can work or something can't and you take a quick decision over it. But sometimes this can work negatively. <coughs> And what you need to do is, at that point, you need to work out that this is negativity. Now, I'll, I'll give you one example. In the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ uh, was attacked very personally. Where the Prophet ﷺ was uh, cut on the blessed face and part of his blessed tooth was chipped. You know, at this point, the most natural response would have been, right, I've had enough. With humanity, I'm done with them. I'm finished with them. How many a prophet prior to the Prophet ﷺ said this to his people? How many a prophet said, look, this is all I could have done. I could have given you nasihat. How many prophets said, فَتَوَلَّا عَنْهُمْ وَقَالَ يَا قَوْمْ لَقَدْ أَبْلَغْتَكُمْ رِسَالَاتِ رَبِّ وَنَسَحْتُ لَكُمْ How many times in the verses of the Qur'an does Allah Almighty say that the prophet turned away from them? And he said, O oh my people, يَا قَوْمِ O oh my people, I've delivered to you the message from my Lord. I've given you all the counsel I could. If you refuse, then what more can I do? I'm on my way. You know, they gave up. The Prophet ﷺ in the Battle of Uhud, he could have said, Why? Why am I being attacked? Because I've called you to justice. Because I've called you to look after the orphans. Because I've called you to integrity. Because I've called you uh, to equality. I've called you to be kind to one another. And, and this is the response that you're going to attack me? I've called you to the worship of Allah Almighty, one God. Sayyidina Siddiqui Akbar said, Are you going to attack a man for saying that there is none worthy of worship except Allah Almighty? You know, is this what. And he could have given up. And you know, at that point, do you know what the Prophet Sallallahu response was? Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ta'lam. Oh Allah, forgive my qawm because they don't know. Yeah, Allah, they still don't know. Do you know what the Prophet ﷺ is doing? He's going back, he's forcing himself وسلم, to think back that these are still my people, good people. You know, they were still the most courageous, weren't they? In their time, the Arabs were the most courageous. Were they not the, uh, the best of poets? Were they not uh, the, the people who looked after pilgrims best? Were they not the best of hosts? I actually know them, they were good people. They haven't suddenly become bad people. They're still my poem, for inna hum la ya'lamun. The problem is that they fail to recognize me. They don't know. That's why they're doing what they're doing. You know, immediately stop the impulsive, I give up on you, I'm done with you, I'm out of here. And the Prophet wasalam, refused. This is really, really important. Uh, then, Athkar, Awrad, Du'as, Salah, all of these are incredibly important to each and every single one of us. You know, what is it that, that we need to be doing? Uh, you, you need to be doing istighfar. You know, you, if you really want to get yourself out of the state of depression, you know, one of the things that you can do is develop a pattern. Practice it at home. Before you, if you suffer anxiety, like you suffer from anxiety from heights, uh, you, uh, you suffer from uh, difficulty whilst uh, uh, facing particular challenges or being under pressure. You know, at home, start practicing how you might deal with that. And one of the ways is you bring mind over matter. Now, what you can't do, what you can't do is say that I'm not going to do it. If you've got a problem with, uh, with heights, if you've got a problem with being uh, above ground level, what happens if you end up with a job on the third floor? You're going to say, well, I can't take that job. No, you can't. 
You, you are going to take that job, you're going to face your anxiety. How are you going to face the anxiety? You're going to do what is appropriate, work out a mechanism that you can use to overcome that. And one of the, one of the best things you can do is just scream, Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhambin wa atubu ilim. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhambin wa atubu ilim. You know, read that. Just read it over and over, over and over, and convince yourself. It's a mental thing. If you've got faith, you will. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you something from uh, the, the life of Imam Malik. It's a beautiful narration. I'm sure you will have all heard this before. Uh, it's, a, it's a narration about uh, uh, Imam Malik who almost rarely left the city of the Prophet ﷺ. He, all, he lived uh, almost uh, virtually his entire life in Medina Sharif. On one occasion he did go out and he was sat in a, in a masjid on uh, one occasion and he sat there, he had nowhere to go that uh, immediate night so he said I'll just spend the night in the mosque um, and whilst he was sitting there the caretaker eventually came into the masjid and said look I've got to lock the masjid up and uh, Imam Malik said to him I've got no, nowhere to go but uh, uh, and, and the caretaker said, well, yeah, I, I appreciate that you've got nowhere to go, but I still have a responsibility and I, I have to lock the masjid up. So he forcefully took Imam Malik out of the masjid and led him to the door. Just as he was uh, taking him out of the door, they passed by another man. Uh, the other man uh, asked, well, you know, what is this? What's, what's going on as Imam Malik is coming out? And Imam Malik explained, I, I was sat here and he's kicked me out of the masjid, he's got to lock up and I've got nowhere to go. And the man said to him, it's okay, you can come with me. Uh, you can spend the night with me, you know, we can't have somebody here in this area. Imam Malik noticed that this guy, as he would walk with every stop, step, he would read, Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. Imam Malik said to him, Rahimahullah, he said, you know, this constant reciting of istighfar, what do you get from it? He said, if truth be told, my Lord has given me everything that I have wished for because I do. He said, everything, everything that I have ever wished for, my Lord has granted to me. Except, except perhaps one thing. There is a great muhaddith called Malik, who have always loved and wanted to see, but I've never ever been able to visit. Perhaps this is the one thing that is in my heart that I haven't encountered yet in my life. But other than this, Allah Almighty has granted me everything from reading Astaghfirullah. And do you know what Imam Malik said to him? Imam Malik rahimahullah said to him, do you know your Lord hasn't just brought Imam Malik to you, he has grabbed him by his collar and dragged him and put him in front of you. That, that's what's happening. I've just been dragged out of the masjid just so that I could be put in front of you because of your astaghfirullah. Yeah, this is how powerful it is. Honestly, this is how powerful istighfar is. <coughs> it really is that powerful. Try it. Read it. It'll change your lives. It'll bring you into a, a, a better harlot. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minal dhalimi Dua of Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam La ilaha illa anta subhanaka There is none worthy of worship except you Glorified, O Allah Almighty Inni kuntu minal dhalimi I'm wrong, I'm sinful, I've made mistakes And Allah Almighty says And we rescued him from depression We rescued him from From sadness La hawla wa la quwata illa billah there is no power, there is no might on earth except with Allah Almighty. Read it. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said in Hadith? The Prophet ﷺ said, is a cure for 99 illnesses. The least of which, Aysaruha, the least of which is hum, is sadness, is depression. You want to get out of depression? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Honestly, make it a practice. Uh, our um, Shaykh, 
uh, often, you know, he recommends to us that you should be reading La Hawla Wa La Quwwata a thousand times between the sunnahs and the fard of your fajr. We're just really bad worried that we don't do it. Uh, but he counsels us for sure to do that. You know, th this is, it's something you need. If you want a good day, this is, this is what you've got to do. Bring yourselves back to the masjid and pray, offer salah. Uh, in, in conclusion, uh, finally, look back at the life of the Prophet Look back at the beautiful life of the Prophet and remind yourself. What Dr. Sahib said at the very beginning, Prophets. Nobody has had a challenge in their life like Prophets have had challenges in their lives. Nobody has. Look at the life of the Prophet He came into this world an orphan. He lost his mother at a tender age. He lost his grandfather at a tender age. He lost the support of his uncle at an incredibly important time. He was persecuted by his own community. He was turned into a refugee. He was attacked for calling people towards good even whilst they all acknowledged that what he's saying is actually good. He was still attacked. And do you know what they say about the Prophet Sayyidina Abdullah ibn al-Harith, you know what he says? مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَكْثَرَ تَبَسُّمًا مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is, this is somebody who's been made a refugee, somebody who's been persecuted. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn al-Harith says, I've never seen anybody in my life smile more than the Prophet You know, even, even when the chips were down, even when in Khandaq everybody was ready and willing to give up, you know, the Prophet he never ever became pessimistic. He never said, it's all over, we're finished. Even in Khandaq. Do you know in, in Khandaq, when, they've got, when they're struggling and they've got no food to eat, you know you heard the incident of uh, the companions having stones tied to their stomach and the Prophet والسلام, revealing to? The, you know the, the incident where the Sahaba can't even break a rock and they say, Ya Rasulullah, we're going into war tomorrow, we can't even break this rock today. And you know, even then, do you know what the Prophet والسلام, he said, do you know Allah Almighty, when he struck the, the rock, he said, do you know Allah Almighty has granted us the white palaces of Iraq? Do you know that he's granted us the kingdoms of Persia? Do you know Allah Almighty has granted us victory over Rome and Syria? He, he was speaking so positively in the most difficult of times. You know, he never ever gave up. Why? Because this is what he loved most. He loved optimism. The Prophet ﷺ said, يُعْجِبُنِي الْفَأْنُ وَالْكَلِمَةُ الْحُسْنَ الْكَلِمَةُ الْتَيِّبَ It's in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, I'll tell you what impresses me most. Optimism impresses me most. الْكَلِمَةُ الْحَسَنَ The positive word impresses me most. You know, when somebody's going through a difficult time, you bring them a hopeful word. Allah Almighty will make things easy for you. Don't worry, everything will be okay. That impresses me most. al kalima to take you about the beautiful word, the reassuring word. That impresses me most. This is who the Prophet ﷺ was. He was an energy of positivity. Yes, he did allow us grief. He did allow us grief. And when you lose somebody, the Prophet ﷺ said, grief. For you don't get punished for what comes from the eyes, the tears. You get punished for what comes from here, the tongue. Don't say anything. You're allowed to grieve. You're suffering loss. You have to let it out. Uh, so we shouldn't be cathartic. We, we shouldn't you know, bring everything to our tongue. You can definitely feel a sense of sorrow. But then deal with it and overcome it. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said for three days, nothing has to be cooked in the household where they suffered uh, a loss, and then once they've experienced that, uh, they are expected to get on uh, with the rest of their lives and continue as per usual. You have to get on and continue. And the Prophet ﷺ brought us a whole sense of hope. Why? Because ultimately, our destination is back to Allah Almighty. And ultimately, Allah Almighty is as you imagine Him to be. Allah in the zanni abdi bi is what Allah Almighty said. I am 
how you perceive me to be. If you can live your life every single day saying, just think about this, you live your life every single day saying, I refuse to accept that Allah Almighty uh, is going to allow me to go to Jahannam. He will protect me and get me to Jannah. Allah Almighty is far too merciful and far too kind. If you can say that, maybe, maybe you will be the, the very subject who when Allah Almighty says, tell him that his punishment is the hellfire and when he's taken a third of the way, he looks back at his Lord uh, and then when he's taken half of the way, he looks back at his Lord and when he's taken three quarters of the way, he looks back on his Lord and Allah Almighty asks him, why? Why is it that you keep looking back at me? And he says, Ya Allah, I keep looking back at you thinking any minute now Allah Almighty is going to say to the angels, let him go entering you to paradise. Let him go. Because all my life, this is all I've ever thought, that you're going to get me into paradise. You know, that's the positivity with which we live. And you know what Allah Almighty says to that subject? He's spoken. Look, how can I now put him into the hellfire when he's so hopeful that I'm going to let him go into Jannah? The Ahlul Jannah. You come from the Ummah of the Prophet Be hopeful. Uh, we we don't give up. We never ever give up. أقول كل هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين.